Ah, uh, the Eternal City. A glorious monument to power, culture, and luxury. But your god king lies frightened by prophecies, circled by omens. Worried to death by a thousand vicious waves, brought low by your own arrogance. You built an empire beyond imagining, the pinnacle of human achievement and the envy of Tevat. But oceans will rise, empires will fall, and the only constant is change. The greatest empire will face the most utter destruction. Did you really think it would last? In its early history, Tevat's first bodies of water were called the Primordial Sea, and from this was the presence of ancient and elemental forces. Looking into the heart of the Primordial Sea, this belonged to none other than the first Hydro Dragon Sovereign. Sources from the Fontaine Glider is hinting that this Primordial Sea is the blood of the Hydro Dragon Sovereign, and that all the life forms that now exist were because of this being. However, its reign ended when Fanes arrived at Tevat, formed four shades of itself, and overthrew all of the seven dragon sovereigns, including their dragon king, Nibelung. Fanes and its four shades then established a new civilization which repopulated the land of Tevat and also formed Celestia. Using the remains of each of the dragon sovereigns, Fanes took an amount of the remaining power and made seven gnosis, each highlighting the elements used in Tevat. With these gnosis, it would be rewarded to a god which they deemed as worthy and gained the title of Archon, allowing them to rule within their respective nations. With the primordial sea left uninhabited due to the death of the first Hydro Dragon Sovereign, the Shade of Life, one of Fanes' four shades, created Egeria to serve as the new heart for the primordial sea. Although Fanes and its shades are of alien origin, the materials used to create Egeria came from Tevat. As Egeria was born, she was akin to that of a god, but at that time, wasn't assigned to any divine duties. However, Egeria wanted to find purpose and seeked understanding and communication. From the ancient natural history excerpts, Egeria was said to have shown compassion to the dragons that first inhabited Tevat and the inevitable fate of humans, which resulted in her shedding the first tear that birthed the first oceanid. With its birth, Jiria commanded this ocean to follow one rule, which was to seek an understanding with the different species in Tevat and connect everyone in the world, similar to how waters all flow as one. This resulted in more oceanids being birthed from tears and now populated the primordial sea. As years passed, the oceanids became envious of the humans and wanted to also live on the surface. To grant this wish, Egeria poured primordial water into their vessels and gave them humanoid forms which allowed them to walk the green and mountainous terrains of Tevat. This deed done by Egeria, however, was seen by Celestia as an act of grave sin, and sentenced her to be sealed for her crimes, as well as claiming that a prophecy would come to dissolve her human oceanids back into their original forms. This was then termed as Egeria's original sin. Jumping to more years later, as the continent of Tevat was reshaped due to a devastating war between Celestia and the second who came, a region closest to the primordial sea called Meropis was resided by scattered tribes of people who survived the war. These inhabitants were isolated within the region's borders, but before long, a huge ship named the Fortuna reached Meropis, and from it, Remus set foot on its shores. In Remus's arrival, there are two variations as to how this was passed on to future generations. In the first variation coming from the goblets of the pristine sea, Remus first appeared in the primordial sea and met with the first sovereign, which we believe to be the primordial one or the inhabitants of Celestia, from which it gave Remus a goblet of primordial water. This presents some similar details with the second variation of the story told by Risley wherein Remus was said to be inspired by divine revelation and found the seer Sibylla who was taking on the form of a golden bee. Remus took this golden bee with him and rode on his ship, the Fortuna, then arriving at Meropis. This gives the idea that Remus was assigned by Celestia to govern Fontaine or Meropis as its ruler. Now, it's still unclear where Remus came from or what the story meant by divine revelation, but for now, it's clear that Remus arrived at Meropis and desired to establish a new kingdom. 
As Remus landed in the region, he used the goblet of primordial water to build his empire, and from his ship the Fortuna, he called the scattered tribes in the area to join his empire and would conquer them if they refused. He collected numerous tribespeople and lockfolk from the islands and taught them how to farm, build, and compose music, which became the highlight of his empire. They felt that music was what differentiates Remus's people from the other kingdoms and held it in great importance. They used phonetic notes as a writing system for their empire and even used a massive musical instrument, the conch harp, for playing music. This highlights the fact that Remus's people based themselves around music and carried each note to the edges of Remuria. With Remus's reign further expanding, it would not, however, shake the confidence of the remaining tribes in the area. One of these tribes, called the Arimorica, were home to Loch Knights who were akin to those of Oceanids, and it is told by legends that they once guarded their home of Arimori Castle located in the mountains. One of these Loch Knights was named Erineus, who featured sea-colored eyes and displayed strength, courage, and respect among her fellow Loch Knights. In her possession is the sword named Hautclair, which is the limited weapon now known as the Splendor of Tranquil Waters. In her time in Arimori Castle, she fought against the princes of three tribes named Belawakoi, Atribatis, and Urumandoi and conquered them. She also took the lands of more tribes such as Perigord, Isis, and the distant south using her renowned sword. From this description alone, she has established a reputation amongst the other independent tribes and also the Empire of Remoria. One day, an envoy sent by Remus traveled to Aramori Castle and requested an audience from the Loch Knights. This envoy invited Erineus and the people in Arimori Castle to submit to the rule of Remus, wherein the envoy asked water and earth as tributes. If the Loch Knights resisted, it would lead to only one outcome, which was war. Erineus requested the envoy to go back to Remoria and cemented her words that the Loch Knights would only worship Egeria. The envoy tried to convince her one last time that Remus's goal for inviting and conquering the other tribes in Fontaine was to unite everyone under his rule and save them from the upcoming prophecy. A prophecy which Egeria first doomed for the people of Fontaine that they would be flooded as a message for washing away their sins. Unconvinced, Erineus still declined the envoy's offer and set up defenses for the upcoming invasion of the Remorian armies. The envoy was escorted back to Fort Charybdis, where Remus's forces were stationed. As days would pass, Remus's forces arrived at the outskirts of Arimori Castle and prepared for a lengthy siege. This would be known as the Song of Harmony. Erineus spent her time unifying the other people who were opposed to Remus's rule and strengthened the defenses of Arimori Castle. Arimori Castle was a well-defended fort on a hill. But this proved nothing to Remus's forces as they started to encircle the fort and cut off any supply lines from the outside. The Remorians constructed a wall fully surrounding the entire garrison, hoping to cut off any escape. In the first engagement, the Loch Knights tried to disrupt these works, but the Remorians were able to form a defensive line to hold them. The Remorian armies had superior numbers and forced the Loch Knights back into the fort, killing as many as they were directed into the narrow gates. This withdrew the Loch Knights from any future engagements as they would want to spare as many men to guard the walls and towers. At midnight, the Remurians began besieging the settlement as they bombarded it using ballistas, onagers, and firepots while some men attempted to approach the walls using siege ladders and battering rams. The Loch Knights tried to defend the walls as valiantly as they could, but Remus's forces and slaves proved to be too much for them. The Remorians finally breached the walls, and numerous skirmishes took place within Armory Castle. The siege lasted hours, till finally all Loch Knights were either dead or captured. Erineus and another member named Cassidor escaped this fate and soon found themselves within the court of Remus. Finally, subduing another major tribe within Meropis or Fontaine, Remoria entered into a golden age, an age of giant cities and temples improved agriculture and aqueducts, and the spread of music across the region. Having built cities across the region, the Eternal City, named as Capitolium, would serve as the Empire's beating heart. All of Remuria's best musicians and poets would converge in this place and share their symphonies. As for the other cities, we only know one named Machimus, which is home to most of Remus's soldiers, 
Now, because we believe that the name Machimus came from Theopompus' work of Bilipica, the other cities could be named Eusebes, meaning pious town, and Anastos, meaning the place of no return, especially since these cities were built on Meropis, the term used for Fontaine's old name. However, this golden age did not last forever. At some point, Remus visited the Kingdom of Dragons and returned to his capital city. From there, he heard of a prophecy regarding the destruction of Remoria and his empire. Due to this, it caused him to become more and more deranged and attempted to mix the primordial water he once obtained with an immortal stone to create a golden ichor. It was to transfer his people's souls into golems, possibly an attempt to avert the part of the prophecy claiming that the people of Remoria would dissolve. In placing the golden ichor full of souls, it allows his subjects to live for eternity as they would all be passed on to golems. Even so, the process of severing soul and body caused unbearable agony and shattered the souls, dyeing the ichor black, making it lose its harmony and wisdom, leaving only chaos and madness. To add to his attempt to prevent the prophecy, he ordered his forces to kill the remaining oceanids, bishops, and other barbarians, believing that they would be the ones responsible for his empire's downfall. This corrupted the primordial sea, rendering it no longer a place for oceanids and other lock folk. This was the beginning of the end for Remus. He was becoming paranoid of this prophecy to the point that it was driving him to madness. Even worse, he believed that these actions he imposed were justice, not realizing that it was his rise of tyranny from a king who was once revered by his subjects and brought them civilization from a life of barbarism. He has now become the barbarian himself because of his actions. At some point, Remus decided to go into a deep sleep for reasons unknown, but before this, he appointed four Harmasts to share his power in ruling Remoria. Harmasts come from a Spartan term meaning military governor or prefect. Now, two of these four Harmasts were Boethius and Cassidor. Looking into their backstory, Boethius was born on an island where its houses were built with weeds and grass. Remoria was expanding at this time and sent more soldiers to conquer more tribes of people, giving the message that they bring civilization to these barbarians and saw their culture as superior to everyone else's. While most of these tribes did not appreciate this, one child was convinced when he was brought to the Capitolium. Boethius, who came to the Eternal City in chains, was amazed with Remoria's culture. In his time within the golden palaces and bronze and marble statues, Boethius became a Remorian and learned in the ways of music. At some time, Boethius met Cassidor, who was made a slave after the conquest of Aramori Castle. The two quickly became friends, and Boethius taught him the things he found beautiful about Remoria and its culture, most especially through music. In his time in the Capitolium, Boethius revered the godhood of Remus, and it was here when Remus began giving him orders to eliminate the Lock Folk. Remus appointed him and Cassidor as his Harmosts after a series of quests and trials. Prior to when Remus took a deep slumber, he believed that his Harmosts would rule Remoria in his place and continue to bring peace. However, this was his greatest mistake, as in his absence, his Harmosts became extremists in carrying out his will from the spring of Sacred Dewdrop. It mentions that everywhere Boethius went, the aqueducts of the Empire were built and oceanids disappeared without a trace, displaying how Boethius was very efficient as a follower of Remus. In response to this tyranny brought by Remoria, a dragon known as Scylla gathered an army of barbarians and bishops and pillaged the towns within the borders of Remoria, destroying towers and slaughtering musicians. This prompted Boethius to wage war with Scylla and resulted in more rebellions and conflicts, officially ending the Golden Age of Remoria. At this time, Aeroneus escaped her imprisonment and rounded up the surviving Lock Knights and tribesfolk, leading another rebel force against Remoria. There is still no clear information about whether Aeroneus and Scylla met and worked together, but one thing is certain, that they want to end the tyranny of Remoria. As for Egeria, she was still locked up by Celestia for actions of creating life using primordial water. This encouraged Irenaeus to search for a relic known as the Pure Grail, which she believed could free Egeria from her captivity. Despite her long search, she was unable to find it, but she could have been relieved that when Remoria fell, Celestia allowed Egeria to ascend as the Hydro Archon. For Remoria's downfall, it seemed that the increasing number of rebellions and civil unrest caused damage to the stabilization of the Empire. 
Ultimately, this led to some elitism, wherein some noble Ramonians rejected and oppressed all those who were not considered true citizens. Instead, saw them as savages and barbarians, not worth saving from the prophecy. This led to more destruction and chaos. As Remoria draws closer to its end, Remus wakes up to the sounds of clashing swords. In a last effort to save his empire, he called for his loyal guards and musicians beside him, attempting to intervene in the war and make peace with Silas' rebels. Unfortunately, his actions seemed treasonous in Boethius' eyes and labeled Remus as a traitor. Boethius then decides to steal the golden ichor and calls for his most loyal soldiers to capture Scylla and seal its power. Following this, it only fulfilled the prophecy and doomed Remoria and its cities, sinking into the ocean depths, ending the reign of the Empire. Following Remoria's destruction, Egeria was freed by Celestia and allowed her to rule Meropes. Egeria gathered the surviving people, allowed them to forgive one another, and taught them to establish new cities around flowing springs, which resulted in an era guided by law that is endured up until the present day. The land of Meropes was now renamed into Fontaine, the nation of water, with Egeria having presented a gnosis and taking her place as the Hydro Archon. While Remoria no longer exists, it left a legacy for the new people of Egeria, especially in arts such as music, drawing, and sculpture. The current citizens of Fontaine became deeply influenced by the Remorians and still remembers how they were pioneers of said arts, also remembering one of their harmosts, Boethius, renowned for being one of the greatest musicians in Fontaine's history. In the present day, musicians in Fontaine still learn and study the musical theories left behind the Remorian Empire, such as the melody of Vesta using a conch harp. To dig in a bit of real-life lore here, the founding of Remoria in Genshin is parallel to the legends surrounding the founding of Rome. In Greco-Roman mythology, Aeneas was said to have found the city of Rome after surviving the Trojan War. In the book Aeneid, written by the Roman poet Virgil, it recounted Aeneas' travels after leaving Troy. In his journey to find a new home for the Trojan refugees, they head towards Italy through the Strait of Messina, but receive warning that the monsters Scylla and Charybdis were said to be guarding this passageway between Sicily and Calabria. So Aeneas avoids the strait, circumnavigates the island of Sicily, and arrives at Italy in the city of Cumae. Here he meets with Sibylla of Cumae, where Sibyl is another term for priestess and requests access to the underworld. In the underworld, Aeneas met and sought guidance with the souls of past Trojan heroes and saw his bright future ahead. After returning from the underworld, Aeneas and the Trojans had a war against the Latins, the native people of the area. To put it shortly, Aeneas won the war and established the city Lavinium and named his son Ascanius as his successor. Ascanius then founded Alba, and around 400 years later, the twin brothers Romulus and Remus were born. However, Romulus killed his twin brother Remus and founded his city of Roma or Rome. In Genshin's version, they switched the twin brothers' places. In place of Romulus, it was instead Remus who went on to conquer Meropes and built the Eternal City. Also, the names of Sibylla and Scylla were used, but given different roles in the story, and the name Charybdis was given to one of Remus's castles, which is Fort Charybdis, mentioned in the history of the decline and fall of Remoria. As for where Remus came from, Genshin writers haven't yet mentioned anything about it, and we have no confirmation that he came from the Primordial Sea, but it would be exciting if they would reference the names of Ascanius or Albalongus as his place of origin. As for the barbarian tribes mentioned earlier, such as Beloakoi, Atrebatis, and Uromandoi, these were all tribes conquered by Julius Caesar during his Gallic Wars campaign. It's interesting how Genshin Impact gives a twist to this, and instead tells that these tribes were conquered by another barbarian, Arimorica. The region of Arimorica was also conquered by Julius Caesar after he defeated the Veneti tribe in a naval battle. In the modern day, Arimorica is currently known as Brittany. Back on the game's lore, there are more questions about this period such as when did the rise of Remoria take place, and what happened to the survivors of the fall of Remoria, and what about the golems mentioned in the book. Starting with the first one, it is theorized that Remoria's rise took place after the first fall of Gurobat. However, some also speculate that it was during the Archon War, which makes it more than 2,000 years ago. As for the survivors of Remoria, they founded the Golden Troop, and Boethius' legacy is carried on by this particular group. In their plans, 
they lure children in an attempt to revitalize the golems. Unfortunately, this will never work again because the i core has already been tainted and corrupted. As for the Remurian golems, stories regarding the Loch Knights and the narrative of Capitolium's destruction both excluded any reference of the said golems. A century after Remuria's collapse, decline and fall of Remuria attests to the existence of such creations and their potential location. However, we can believe that these structures were never really functional. They were not used by the Empire when it was in existence, but they were part of a major project that was never finished and became a source of faith for Remurian loyalists after the fall. Remoria has a lot more in store for Genshin's lore and world building, and we'll be excited to give more videos about it, especially since it features a lot of ancient Rome and its mythologies. Now, if you have more to add to this story, feel free to do so in the comments. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, my name is Clementsheim. Until the next one, be safe and stay tuned.